start this morning with uh, a passage from the book of Luke, chapter 17, and reading verses 11 through 14. And this is what it says. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of the Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lift up, lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourself to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. Now in Bible days, one of the worst labels that could be put on you, one of the worst diagnoses to receive was leper. It was a death sentence. Lepers were cut off from everything. They couldn't stay with their families. They weren't eligible to go to the synagogue and worship. They couldn't be in the community. They had to live outside of the towns. In fact, the book of Leviticus has entire chapters with how to deal with lepers and even what to do if their clothes touched your clothes. Everywhere they went, they had to yell, unclean! unclean. Imagine having to announce to everybody everywhere you went what was wrong with you. How horrifying. But that was the life of a leper. It was a life of despair. It was a life of isolation. It was a life of loneliness. And here we find 10 lepers who see Jesus is coming. This is Luke 17. So by now, surely, these guys have heard that Jesus can heal. Surely by now they heard about what happened several chapters back in Luke chapter five, where a leper from Galilee, not far from them, came to Jesus, have mercy on me. And what did Jesus do? He reached out his hand and touched the man and said, be cleansed. And just like that, the leprosy was gone, completely gone. Jesus gave that man two instructions. Number one, don't tell anybody, and he didn't follow that. And number two, go show yourself to the priest and give the sacrifice that Moses required. The man went out and told everybody, guess what Jesus did, guess what Jesus did. I would do that. I mean, if I, I was cut off from everybody and I was diseased and now I can go back, I'm telling everybody. So surely by now, that big mouth man had told so many people that these 10 lepers had heard, so they see Jesus coming. Can you imagine how excited they must have gotten? Can you imagine their anticipation and hope starting to rise? <gasps> Would Jesus do for me what he did for that leper? <gasps> Could this, could this be a good day? So in their loudest voice, they scream because they can't get too close. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now think for just a minute. They've screamed out their request, and before Jesus replies, it probably feels like those words are hanging in the air. What's going to happen? Did he hear me? How, how quickly can the leprosy go away? He cleansed that other man immediately. <gasps> can I go home today? Could this be the day I get to go back and <gasps> my wife can cook dinner for me? <gasps> Will I get to go to synagogue next week and worship with everybody? And they start to think about all the things they will do when Jesus does what they've asked. But don't we do the same thing sometimes? We ask Jesus for something and we begin to think, <gasps> When Jesus fixes this for me, I can go here and there and there and there. When Jesus fixes my finances, then I can give to missions in Philippines. When Jesus fixes my family, then we can all come to church together. And we start to plan. But Jesus gave a response that was not what they expected. He said, go show yourself to the priest. Wait, 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 wait. That's not what they asked for. Wait, I, I, I asked you to heal me. Wait, wait, what? No, that's not what I asked for. They asked for Jesus to do something, and he gave them an assignment. He said, go show yourself to the priest. In this moment, they have a choice to make. 
Are they going to do what they've been told? Are they going to do their assignment? Or are they going to get mad and walk away? Let's put this in a little simpler terms. I'm going to take you on a flashback to my childhood, a favorite memory in the 80s, the Karate Kid movie. How many of you see, have seen the original Karate Kid? Yes! Classic 1980s. So if, you've, if you're not familiar with the movie, there's the young man and he wants to learn karate so bad because he's being bullied and he wants to be able to defend himself. So the master karate teacher, Mr. Miyagi, says, okay. And Daniel's son goes to learn karate and he's given an assignment. Sand the floor. What? Do the assignment. Sand the floor. Goes the next day, another assignment. Wax on. Wax off, wax on, wax off. He want, he's asked for one thing, but he's being given assignments to do. Comes again, paint the fence, up, down, side, side. And the young man's doing the tasks, but he gets so frustrated. I asked you for this and you're giving me all this work to do and throws a fit. And then the wise teacher says, show me, wax on, wax off, boom. Boom! And the classic scene, and the young man begins to see that by doing the assignments he'd been given each day, he was actually getting what he asked for. He was willing to do the assignments. So we got to wonder then, what about the lepers? Are they willing to go show themselves to the priest? They're not qualified, but they start out, and they make the decision to obey Jesus and do the assignment and start walking. There had to be some fear. Step number one, I, I still have spots. Step number two, my, my ear's still missing. See, leprosy body parts would start to fall off, but they kept walking. I can imagine their conversation. This is crazy. Why didn't he just heal us? Why do we gotta keep walking? They kept going, doing what Jesus told them to do. There was a risk, because if they get to the priest and they're not cleansed yet, oh, the shame, oh, the embarrassment. They could even cause harm to others by contaminating them. But maybe, just maybe as they were walking, they recalled Psalm 71, 1, which says, in you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be put to shame. Maybe, step number 45, 105, 200, maybe they prayed. Psalm 119, 116, uphold me according to your word that I may live and do not let me be ashamed of my hope. They kept walking, they kept walking, they kept walking. As they went, they were cleansed. Which step did it happen on? We don't know. Was it number five, 55, 500? We don't know. We just know that as they kept doing what Jesus told them to do, as they went, they were cleansed. As they moved in obedience to the assignment God had given them, they were healed. They were equipped. They were made eligible to stand before the priest. See, our challenge so many times is, we want our answer, and we want all the conditions to be right before we'll move in a response to, in, to God, what God's asking us to do. Sometimes we'll pray, Lord, save my family. And he'll say, go witness in Kowloon Park. No, see, I, I asked you to save my family, but he gives us an assignment to do first. And as we go and do that assignment, as we learn to share our testimony, he gives us words to say to our family members as they see our faithfulness. We pray, God, heal my broken heart. And he says, I want you to teach Sunday school, but I'm too wounded. I'm too broken. I'm not smart enough. I'm not trained. And God gives you the assignment. Do the assignment. As you do what he tells you to do, he equips you for what he's asked you to do. We say, I'm not qualified. I'm not educated. I'm too broken. It's not the right time. I don't have enough money. 
But if we will move in response to what God's asked us to do, he qualifies, he heals, he restores, he equips. Psalm 32, 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. John 14, 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said. We have to move in obedience to what he has said. You know, has God given you an assignment? Did you ask for something? And instead of giving you what you asked for, he gave you an assignment? Start moving. Nothing happens while you're sitting, si sitting still when he's given an assignment. See, sometimes, though, we, we think the, uh, the assignment's incomplete. God didn't give me all the instructions. I think of Philip from Acts chapter 8, and Pastor Jennifer spoke so beautifully about Philip a couple weeks ago. God gave Philip an instruction, and it, it, you know, when you look at it, you think, huh, something's missing. Chap Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. That's it. That's all he told him. See, I want to know why. What am I supposed to do when I get there? Um, and, and God, don't you know I'm in the middle of something else right now? All God told him was go walk. Just go this direction. Sometimes we want to know all the information before we'll move. But look what happens in verse 27. So he started out and on his way met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candake, which means queen of the e Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Did you catch it? On his way, he met the Ethiopian. He didn't get all the instructions. He didn't know what he was going to do until he started moving in obedience to God's assignment. Can we move when God just gives us one little piece of the assignment? When God says, take the bus today instead of the MTR. But Lord, the MTR is my route. But Lord, who does God have for you to talk to on the bus instead of the MTR? Because Philip obeyed and would move at just a partial instruction, God had an appointment for him to meet someone from the royal court of Ethiopia. He shared the gospel. He shared about Jesus Christ, and the man was baptized. Who knows what happened when that Ethiopian got back home? Who did he share the gospel with? Family? Friends? Perhaps even the queen? Can you move when God says, Go through this park today instead of that park. Can we move when it's just a partial instruction? Sometimes God gives us an assignment or directions, and we think, ah, timing's not right for this. I think of Joshua and the children of Israel in chapter 3 of the book of Joshua. It's time to cross the Jordan River. God gives the instruction and says, the priest should go stand in the middle of the river with the ark. One problem. It was flood season. The river's at its highest level during flood season. I can imagine some of the priests thinking, boy, who's this young guy, Joshua? Huh, bet Moses wouldn't have made us do that. Huh. Doesn't he know it's flood season? He want us to, st we're gonna drown. But they obeyed and they went. And what does the Bible tell us in verse 15 and 16 of chapter three of Joshua? Now the Jordan is at flood stage during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. As they went, the water didn't stop flowing until they got there and got to the edge and put their feet in. Nothing happens until we start moving. Can we move when God gives us an assignment? Can we follow his assignment when, the, when it's only partial? Can we follow when the conditions don't appear right? We got to move when God gives direction, but sometimes we make a move out of desperation. Sometimes our situation is so hopeless, we got to do something. It takes me to 2 Kings chapter 6 and chapter 7. 
This is the story of the city of Samaria is under siege. The Arameans have come and they've battled and they've shut the city off. Famine has ensued. Nothing's getting into the, ci into the city. Nothing is getting out. The situation is so desperate, so desperate. They've even resorted to cannibalism. Can you imagine? I can't imagine that level of hunger, but that's where they were. That's how desperate it was at this time. And there were four lepers outside the city. Their condition was even worse. And they said, hmm, if we stay right here, we're gonna die. If we go to the city, we're gonna die. If we go towards the enemy's camp, we might live. We might live, or they might kill us. Huh. Two out of three, we know we die. This one, there's a chance at life. So out of desperation, they begin to move in the one direction that has possibility of life. As they begin to move, God begins to do a miracle. He causes the enemy to hear the sound of a great army coming. He multiplies and magnifies their steps. It's not just their little steps, but it's boom, 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 boom. The enemy hears an army coming. The enemy, the enemy is so scared. The Arameans, they flee. They leave their gold, their food, their horses, everything. They run. They run away and leave it all there. Four lepers come in. They have a feast. Buddy, they are eating like it's Christmas Day. They're just ah, eating. They're, they're taking stuff to hide it, but they realize they can't keep this to themselves, so they go back and share the news in the city, and the king sends out scouts and finds that it is as they say. The famine is over. Everything is different because these four men dared to move out of desperation. When your situation is so desperate that you begin to move in the only direction that offers life, God begins to move on your behalf. And let me tell you, the only direction today that offers life is toward Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. How desperate is your situation? Are you desperate enough to move toward Jesus? Sitting right where you are isn't helping anything. Past has nothing to offer. Do you have financial crisis? Family crisis? Health crisis? Is, do you feel like all hope is gone? In your desperation, start moving toward Jesus. Start moving toward Jesus. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So when you start moving, God starts moving. You take a step, God takes a step. The enemy doesn't just hear your little footstep. He hears, boom, the footstep of God Almighty. All the host of heaven coming to your aid. When the enemy of our soul hears God moving on our behalf, he runs. He runs away. You have nothing to lose. Move toward Jesus. Move toward Jesus, and he will move toward you. There was a lady in our church several years ago. She was in desperate financial situation, desperate, desperate, desperate. And after dad had preached one Sunday on tithing, she came to my mother with tears in her eyes and put an envelope in her hand. She said, Sister Jerry, this is my first tithe. I have nothing else to lose. My way isn't working. I have to move toward God. I have to try it his way. And God, within weeks, began to turn her life around and began to fix her finances because she dared in her desperation to move toward Jesus. When you begin to move toward Jesus, it's not just about you. The enemy's defeated and many are delivered because you move. When the four lepers moved, the enemy was defeated and an entire city was delivered. Whose deliverance is dependent upon your moving toward Jesus? 
when you move toward Jesus, God can do a work in your family. You become a light in darkness to your family. So, question, how desperate are you? Are you desperate enough to move toward Jesus? So, okay, Julie, that's great. I'm gonna do my assignment. I'm gonna move toward Jesus. So everything's going to be great now, right? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I wish I could tell you that it was. But oftentimes when we move in obedience to God's instruction, things get hard. Chaos breaks out all around us. And we wonder, <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> I'm doing what Jesus asked me to do. What, how did I get here? Oh, friends, take heart. Because in these moments, Jesus comes to us. He came to the disciples in the middle of a storm. It's recorded in three out of the four gospels. When something makes it into three out of the four, we need to pay attention. In three out of the four Gospels, we have the, the story recorded of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And immediately after that, he told the disciples, get into the boat, cross to the other side. He gave them an assignment to do. So they did. They got in and started rowing, started rowing, and a storm broke out. This was no small storm. Brother Stephen said it earlier in the, in the opening of the service, this was a big storm. They were scared. I have a question. How bad does a storm have to be to scare experienced, seasoned fishermen? These weren't little boys. These weren't, you know, teenagers out on their first time across the sea. These were weather-worn veterans. These were men who had been raised on the sea. But this storm was so strong, it scared them. It was so strong that after rowing for nine hours, they'd only traveled three miles. This was a big storm. Have you ever been there? You've started doing what God called you to do, what God, the assignment he asked you to do, and it's hard, and you're rowing, and everything is going wrong. Why am I here? Does Jesus see me? Does he care? And the temptation is to get out of the boat. The temptation is to stop doing the assignment Jesus gave us. Because we'll think, before I started doing this, life was pretty good. Let me go back and stop doing that. Don't get out of the boat. Stay there. None, stay there. Stay in the boat. Keep doing what Jesus asked you to do. Don't despair. He sees you. Mark 6, 48 says, He saw the disciples straining at the oars. Jesus never takes his eyes off his children. He sees your difficulty. He knows how long you've been toiling. You are not forgotten. In the fourth watch of the night, nine hours after sunset, it would be between 3 to 6 a.m., the very darkest part of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the water. He will come to you at just the right time. You may be thinking, I want to quit. Keep moving. It's dark and it's scary. I keep moving. Jesus doesn't see me. He's forgotten me. Keep moving. He came to them as they kept moving, as they kept doing what Jesus told them to do. He came to them and he will come to you keep moving. Jesus came to them and he got into the boat. And when he got into the boat, two things happened. Number one, the wind died down without a word spoken by Jesus. Matthew and Mark both tell us he got in the boat and immediately the winds were quiet. Have you ever been in a noisy, chaotic room? Everyone's just ah, frantic and buzzing about. And, ah. Then the leader the one with authority walks in and suddenly, without saying a word, just by entering the room, everything is silent because the one with authority has walked in. When Jesus comes and comes into your chaos, it has to cease. He doesn't even have to speak 
to the chaos because his presence and authority are enough to bring peace and calm to any situation. And the second thing that happened when Jesus got in the boat, John records, is that immediately the boat reached the destination. Immediately they were at land where they were supposed to be safely on shore. When Jesus gets into the boat with you, you will finish the task. You will finish the task safely. So I want to just remind you of a few things as we close today. As they went, they were cleansed, equipped, and qualified. As they went, the enemy was defeated. As they went, deliverance came to many. As they went, Jesus came and calmed the chaos. As they went, Jesus helped them complete their assignment. So where do you find yourself today? Have you asked for an, for an answer and been given an assignment? Are you in a state of desperation? Are you in the middle of one of the biggest struggles of your life? Start moving. Keep moving. Keep moving. Move toward Jesus. Move in obedience of the assignment that he's given. He will come and he will take care of you. Can we stand and close in prayer? Oh, Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that you do all things well. You know just what we need, just when we need it. So, God, we submit ourselves to you today. God, we declare, God, that we will be faithful to do the things that you've asked of us. If they don't make sense, if we don't understand, we will follow you in obedience, God. Lord, we thank you that when we are in times of desperation, when we draw near to you, you draw near to us, God. We thank you, God, that you never forget us, God. Lord, that when you see us toiling, when you see us struggling, doing what you've asked, you come and you bring calm and you bring peace, God. We thank you. God, go with us today. God, go with us this week. You see the things that wait for each of us just outside this door. So God, we go with your word. We go equipped with your power, God. Go with us and bring us back together, Lord, at the next time. We thank Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.